if we can change the pig's genome, the pig has a three billion letter genome, if we can change a few letters of that genome, we can make pigs resistant to diseases like porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus, transmissible gastroenteritis virus, Seneca Valley virus, just by changing a few letters of the genome can have a huge impact. Um, PERS, for example, um, cost producers in North America, and this is decade old I information, estimated in North America to be $660 million a year. We have a solution for this disease. To genetically engineer the pigs so they're resistant to PERS, it's, it's really a pretty straightforward process. We can go in and do something called zygote injection. We get a freshly fertilized embryo, we inject some editing reagents, and it edits that three billion letter genome. and It can change just a couple letters and that will make it so that the pig doesn't get sick. It doesn't see the virus. So there's a molecule that basically sticks up on the cell surface that the virus recognizes to infect the cell. By changing a couple letters of the genome, you can get rid of that molecule. And now the virus has no way to get in. There's lots of variations for genetic engineering, and I use the broad term because it can be as simple as changing a couple letters of the genome, a three billion letter genome. It can be as elaborate as going to another species and getting their gene and putting it in the pig. So for example, we've taken a gene from C. elegans, which is a little roundworm, and the gene encodes a fatty acid desaturase. We put it into pigs, the pigs make their own omega-3 fatty acids. So we can kind of cut and paste, and so that's a little bit more elaborate type of genetic modification. The very simple one is to just change a couple letters, and in, this, in the case of PERS, get rid of CD163, and the pigs don't get sick. We've done the same thing with a, another protein called aminopeptidase N, another molecule that sticks up on the cell surface. In this case, transmissible gastroenteritis recognizes that molecule. You get rid of it, the pigs don't get sick. We can go in and take a pig and do random mutations using chemicals or radiation, and we can eat that pig. FDA doesn't regulate that. In fact, you've probably eaten mushrooms. Mushrooms now, they've, it, they've, they've used the same technology that I'm talking about to change a few letters of the genome in the mushroom so that a protein that's made at the end of, at the, end of the cycle that helps it to ripen is gone, so it has a longer shelf life. You've already eaten those because nobody regulates fungi. That's but because we know what letters of a three billion letter genome we changed, a couple letters, now FDA regulates as a, as a new drug. Our first pigs where we added a gene was we, uh, jellyfish, you've been to the aquarium and seen jellyfish, they turn on the UV light and they fluoresce. Well, we took that same gene from the jellyfish and put it into pigs so we have pigs that glow green when you shine a blue light on them. And people say, well, why would you do that? Well, initially we did it because it's an easy way to tell if we made the genetic modification as a demonstration. But as it turns out, those are some of the most popular pigs we have. People want them to use these pigs and cells from these pigs to track cells. So if you're doing a stem cell study and you have what you think are retinal progenitor cells or cells that should be able to differentiate into the rods and cones in the back of the eye of the retina, and you take a pig and you damage the retina to simulate retinal damage in humans, well now you can take stem cells and put them in there and then you can determine if the pig can now see better. Well, when you're done with the experiment, you harvest the eye, you look at those cells, turn on the UV light, they fluoresce, you know those are the cells that you put in that facilitated the repair. So that's actually our most popular. We, we send more cells out and pigs out of that than anything. So the second gene we knocked out is a gene called galactosyl transferase. And that's a gene that makes an enzyme that puts a molecule up on the cell surface that we all recognize as foreign. So if you take a pig cell tissue or organ and put it into a human, we, we have pre-existing antibodies that recognize that molecule. That molecule is also on the surface of bacteria. So all of us have coursing through our veins right now antibodies that recognize that. So now if you take a pig cell tissue or organ and put it in any one of us, those pre-existing antibodies bind it and you immediately get rejection. The cells die. They call it hyperacute rejection. So what we did was to go in and knock out that gene so that the enzyme didn't get made so that molecule isn't on the cell surface anymore. When these organs are transplanted to a human or non-human primate, there's absolutely no sign of that hyperacute rejection. 
Well, it's, it, it was like a brick wall and nobody could get past that. And when we knocked that out, that brick wall came down. And now you could see all the other problems that crop up with rejection process. And so about a year ago, we heard about pig organs, uh, kidneys and hearts going into people. Well, they've added about another nine mutations into those pigs, either adding genes uh, that will help prevent the rejection process or getting rid of other molecules that are causing the rejection process. And so that's what had to be done to be able to um, do the xenotransplantation um, or pig organs to humans. Yeah. Well, we had a collaborator co contact us, uh, Conrad, from University, Me University Medical School of South Carolina. And he said, we have this problem when human infants are born and they have defective valves in their heart we can do valve transplants and it's quite successful, but the valves don't grow. So now as this kid grows, you've got to go in and re keep replacing them. He says, I've got an idea that we can uh, do to make the valves grow. And his idea was basically do a partial heart transplant. So instead of just taking the valve, take the tissue around the valves so that you still have all that supporting infrastructure and transfer a partial heart. He says, I want to use your green pigs as donors so that when we track it and when we're done, we can harvest the heart and make sure that those cells are the ones that, that did the repair. And uh, about three months later, we get an email from him showing the data, showing that the valves are growing over time. He said, this is amazing. It's never happened before. Nobody's ever seen this. A couple weeks later, we get an email from him that says, oh, by the way, uh, this partial heart transplant, the fourth one's been done, three in pigs, the first one in humans has been done. So. It was a human to human partial heart transplant. It was baby Owen, because this kid is doing fine. At Christmas, we got an email um, from, from our collaborator at Medical University of South Carolina said, and had a picture of him and basically said, because of the work that you guys have helped us do, Owen can celebrate his first Christmas. Is that cool? We're a very small cog in a great big wheel, but we're still a little bitty part of it.